Hello, everyone. Lattice last morning is from the wanderinginvestor.com. So today I'm with Scott Osharoff, who is the chief investment officer of a Uzbekistan focused fund and who's an active investor in the whole region. And today we'll be discussing a very interesting, I'll call it a thesis, if I can call it this way, Scott, the new fertile crescent. So it's a term that you developed and that you've built a thesis around. And it's quite interesting. So I'll let you elaborate. Thanks, Ladislas. Good to see you. So uh, the concept of the new Fertile Crescent really came about when I was looking at you know, the original Fertile Crescent, which, of course, stems from the Middle East, specifically Iraq, where you have the convergence of the Euphrates and Tigris rivers, um, which was the breadbasket of the world, um, you know, a thousand plus years ago. And looking at what's happening in Asia specifically, uh, you're, you're seeing the bifurcation of the world, which uh, throws in or com what com it is, you know, uh, deglobalization and a host of other things. So it's something I've been looking at for five or six years. And it's, it's a term that I coined, I think in 2020, where being based in Tashkent, Uzbekistan, and looking at who the regional players are, what political alliances and influence there is in the region, what's happening is the world to bifurcate between East and West. And as I think we've talked about before, I firmly believe, and, and you sort of saw it during COVID that with the acceleration of it, that the, the West is becoming um, more socialist and more authoritarian, and the East is becoming more authoritarian, but it's remaining capitalist. So the question becomes, where would you prefer to do business? For me, I'd prefer to do business in Asia or what I call the new fertile crescent. And you know, when you look at a map, if you look at the Middle East up through Central Asia, and then you look at China and Russia on either side of Central Asia, throw in Iran and Turkey um, and you know, put a line through it, it looks like a crescent. And this part of the world has relatively low debt to GDPs, young fast growing populations, it's resource rich, and more importantly, when you look at the deglobalization of the world and the inflationary uh, aspects associated with that, a lot of these countries, for in one way, shape, or form, have gone through um, import substitution. So a lot of them have already suffered significant inflationary forces over the past two or three decades. For example, Iran, Turkey to a degree, uh, Uzbekistan, which means that you have domestic industry. Um, the polar opposite of the West, which has seen their industry hollowed out over the past 20 or 30 years. So looking forward, um, it was a, a loose sort of concept that I um, formed uh, as to what was happening in the region. But I, I imagine that China is ultimately going to become the driving force behind this new fertile crescent, with Russia being a significant player as well, but more on the lines of to a degree, politics, but certainly um, militarily, and then from a, a resource standpoint. And this region has very much been fractured over the past you know, 100 years plus. Um, the Soviet Union, of course, provided some coherence. But nonetheless, if you look at the Middle East, you know, Iran and Saudi Arabia have been enemies for quite some time, um, or there's been conflict, at least, due to religious issues. Um, I believe it was in 2016 that Syria and Saudi Arabia broke off um, uh, diplomatic ties. And nonetheless, there's been an incentive for perpetual instability in the region because the US, for example, has wanted to be able to maintain a superiority in the region through its influence. But some really interesting things have happened in the last month, which sort of confirmed to me that this whole region is beginning to solidify more powerful and independent, if you will, um, without the West being so actively involved. And China is the driving force behind it. You know, just last month in March, we saw that China helped the broker a ceasefire agreement between the Houthis, uh, well, effectively Iran and Saudi Arabia, by um, getting the Houthis in Yemen to stop firing rockets into Saudi. So those two countries have now announced that they're going to reestablish diplomatic ties. Syria and Saudi Arabia are in negotiations to reopen embassies. Um, and as a result of some of that, you've seen Saudi Arabia also announced that they're joining the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, 
um, which is huge, along with a bunch of other countries from Venezuela to Egypt, which are uh, um, sort of on the waiting list. So you know, in a few years, you could very well have 50 plus percent of uh, GDP and the global population being involved in something like the Shanghai Cooperation Summit, much to the dismay of the United States and the West, um, if, as well. If, last, if I may, so we're seeing all these countries joining the SCO, right? Um, so you're saying, so Saudi Arabia is joining, there are other countries on the waiting list, like Egypt, like Venezuela. Great. But don't we risk at some point of of seeing an SCO that's actually meaningless? Because all these people from all these countries from different parts of the world are just together as a talking shop. And then it ends up being like ASEAN in Southeast Asia, where nothing really happens. It's just a talking shop. Like how significant is it actually? Well, I think to a large degree, that's sort of what the SCO is. Um, but if you've got a talking shop that is sort of to a degree anti-West um, and it brings countries that are uh, of some type of uh, influence um, into the orbit of China and Russia, that becomes increasingly powerful. When you talk about the new Fertile Crescent, which countries exactly do you include in this? Let's say this includes more or less the entire Middle East, um, up through Central Asia, so Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, uh, Uzbekistan, uh, Russia and China, of course. I would fa I would throw Turkey into it, Iran into it, most certainly. And then if you look at, it's a bit of a stretch geographically, but I, I would throw in Pakistan and India, India specifically, they've been a, a long-term ally of Russia. Um, I, I don't really think that they are um, uh, very anti-Chinese because they do a lot of business with the Chinese. I think it's there's a degree of propaganda in the media that makes it seem like you know India and China are on the verge of kinetic, kinetic war all the time, even with the things that you've seen in the North, of course. But um, nonetheless, um, I think India is going to play ball with, with these countries because they need to from a resource standpoint, from a um, military arms standpoint, etc. So these would be the countries I would include in the new fertile crescent. Clear. So how do you how do you play this as a as a Western investor? Because I I I completely understand. I mean, the, the West is becoming increasingly uninvestable. Um, taxes are going up, regulations are going up, um, more and more restrictions. It's increasingly co complicated to make money in the West and to keep the money that you make because of all these capital gains taxes. And especially in, in Europe with the whole energy situation, we find ourselves in a situation where we used to get Russian gas because it was cheap. And now that Russian gas is gone, we're buying American and Qatari LNG instead, which is a lot more expensive. And then the Russian gas, which was ours, is now going to the new Fertile Crescent, and they're paying a discount for it um, because, because of the Western sanctions. So Europeans have really shot themselves in the foot. So not only is gas more expensive in Europe now, but it also resulted in, in an extra discount for our direct competitors. So I, I can see why you would prefer to invest there from a macro point of view, but concretely, how do you do this as a Westerner? Because I mean, last time I, I tried something like that in February, <laughs> 2022. I'm still stuck with a bunch of Russian ADRs and I'm staying. So I don't know if I'm, I'm a little too traumatized from the experience, but I'm also staying away from Chinese assets. Um, I had a brokerage account in, in Hong Kong for a while. Um, I had quite a bit of money there. I used it as diversification, but in the past year I have reduced it by 99%. Uh, I just have some unlisted company on a brokerage account that I somehow can't transfer anywhere. So that's like my only exposure to Hong Kong at this point, uh, because I feel that sure, you have really attractive valuations, but at some point the European Union or the US are going to come in there and just ensure I lose everything. So how do you play it? So I, I think there are a lot of ways to play this region because it's so vast and it's so dynamic. Um, Specifically, I think that over the next few years, you're going to realize that resource nationalism 
is going to become a regional nationalism from a resource standpoint is going to become huge. Um, you know, you look at Europe and they don't really want Russian oil and gas and coal. Nonetheless, some of it's still ending up there with ship to ship transfers off the coast of Spain and whatnot. But now you're seeing if you if you look at Russian uh, Ural's crude prices, they're trading at a fat discount to Brent, which means that countries like India uh, and China can buy discounted crude, which does wonders for their economy. Um, look at grains as well. So it is you have this bifurcation of, of the world. Uh, I think that this new Fertile Crescent block, you're going to see more countries um, become resource nationalists. And if they're able to uh, withhold resources from the international market, or at the very least cause friction in the market, which means it's more expensive to do business and buy these commodities, um, and, and they do business more with other neighbors in these uh, in this block, then technically that just results in uh, you know larger shortages globally, which means commodities prices go up. So one way to play it would be just to invest into commodity producers wherever they might be listed in the stock market because you're getting broad exposure to this bifurcation of the world. Um, when I look at it from a more a micro standpoint, you know, Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan has a stock market. It's very cheap. You can go and open a brokerage account. Um, I think you've done a video on that, talking yeah. about you know a group out there. So there are ways to get direct exposure to these countries. I mean, Iran is really the golden goose, but unfortunately, it's still sanctioned. Um, and like you mentioned with um, or hinted at with Russian equities, um, you know, sure you can't actively trade uh, Russian equities if you're from what's termed an unfriendly country. But nonetheless, if you bought, for example, Sberbank, uh, one of the largest banks in Russia, uh, I think one or two days before uh, trading of the, the GDRs in London um, was frozen. Well, if you look at the price in Russia now on the on the Moscow exchange, I think you're up 20 times and they're paying dividends as well. So not an ideal situation. But if you look out over the next few years, I don't think so sanctions are going to last forever. They could last certainly for longer than anyone would expect. Just look at Iran. Um, but there's still value to be had there. Equally, being that you're a big real estate investor, you look at real estate in a lot of these markets. And real estate's cheap. Yields are good. There's huge potential for capital appreciation. Because again, if you look at a lot of these countries from Iran to Turkey to Central Asia, exclude China to a degree, because in the next <laughs> few years, they're going to have a population crisis. But um, you've got large growing middle classes where the average age is between 25 and, say, 33. Um, the cost of capital is coming down significantly, but nonetheless, it's still high. Uh, the central bank policy rate in Uzbekistan, for example, last month got lowered from 15 percent down to 14 percent. But if you want to get a mortgage for a home, you're still paying 25 percent plus and you need to provide 125 percent collateral. So is the cost of capital comes down in these markets, you're going to have a huge boom in real estate. And again, its populations are growing. It's very similar to the baby boom generation in the West um, in, in the 1970s and 80s. It's that same play. So there's a lot of ways to get exposure. It just depends what type of exposure one wants. And sorry mm -hmm. for being vague. No, I hear you. We actually met in Tashkent in Uzbekistan. And I bought some, bought some shares there. I've been very happy. They've done great. Um, some of them have just stagnated, but a few of them just went through the roof. And so my, my average has been, has been very good. But yeah, it's not that easy because a lot of these countries also from a real estate point of view have restrictions in terms of foreigners buying. Uh, they're often quite nationalistic when it comes to, to real estate. So not easy to get exposure to these countries. And obviously not all of them, but some of them. And then the stock markets are often rather undeveloped. So it's not, it's not the easiest of places to get exposure. But if you can, and there are ways, I agree, um, it's, it's a good one. But what about the Caucasus, so, for example? So Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, are they, do you include them in the, the new Fertile Crescent? Certainly. Um, you know, they've got very large strategic relationships with Russia and China. Of course, there's also influence from the U.S. there. Um, but nonetheless, 
you know, it was canceled, if I'm not mistaken, but there was supposed to be a very large deep water port built in uh, Georgia by the Chinese. Now I believe DP World is looking to get involved. So you know, this, this new Fertile Crescent concept also, of course, ties in a bit just from a, a logistical standpoint with China's Belt and Road Initiative. You know, if you, th- this whole region really is the, the connecting aspect between East and West. So if you look at the movement of commodities, manufactured goods, and you don't want to go by sea, then this new fertilizer becomes exceptionally important. But also the fact that they've got their own industry and you're probably going to see regional trade blocks become more and more important. For example, the Eurasian Economic uh, um, EAEU. So you've got, I think Iran is supposed to actually join the EAEU, which is a, a duty-free economic union between um, some post-Soviet countries. Iran is supposed to join it by September, which will be huge because they have the biggest manufacturing capacity um, of any of the EAU countries, maybe besides um, Russia, which means they'll be able to flood the market. And you're already seeing a lot of Iranian products in the Caucasus, in Central Asia. Um, So... Yeah, the Caucasus is very much uh, a part of what I call this new fertile crescent region. And I, I think what you're you're highlighting is is very important in terms of the bifurcation of the world because it's not just a, a new regional block that's being that's being formed. Um, bifurcation is the, the right terminology because it's essentially a block that will be against the West. So whether the block actively seeks to be against the West or not is a, is a different topic, but the West will view this as an enemy. Um, I mean, we're talking of a block with Iran under sanctions, Russia under sanctions, China increasingly under sanctions, um, effectively, you know, all the, all the export restrictions, et cetera, towards China, Saudi Arabia and Turkey that are under threat of sanctions by many politicians in the West. So what will be the implications if this block actually kind of does move forward increasingly and start becoming a bit more politically connected and economically connected? What would be the impact on the U.S. dollar? You know, people have called for the demise of the U.S. dollar for longer than I've been alive. Um, so certainly you're seeing more international trade done in, uh, you know, in particular, you know, Chinese RMB. When Xi Jinping was in Russia in the past week or two, if I'm mistaking, um, they announced that they would be doing more trade, especially in the commodity sphere in RMB, and that Russia would be doing business with African countries in RMB. You saw Ghana, which is on the verge of a debt crisis and has been for a while, uh, selling gold in order to buy oil. So I, I think it's a mix of you're going to see more business done in commodities and the diversification of uh, currencies that business is done in. Uh, the, the country escapes me, but last week it was announced that it was, uh, don't remember, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia is going to start doing business with, it was Kenya in shillings for oil. Um, so, and again, the fact that Saudi announced a significant investment in petrochemical plants and refineries uh, in China means that, sure, you're moving away from the dollar, Um, But we still have this, perhaps we see the formation of a second quasi-financial system, which doesn't, uh, is not dollar um, denominated, if you will, Um, but we'll have to see what happens. I I think what makes sense from what I'm seeing in the world, especially living in this new fertile crescent, is uh, I'm looking to have capital both in, in the West and in the East for diversification. I don't think that this new fertile crescent region and the East in general is going to, I I look at this as sort of moving puzzle pieces. It's not like there's going to be a new Berlin wall made. Uh, So you'll still be able to move capital around. The question is perhaps um, will certain countries in East or West, um, I think there's probably a greater risk of this over the next 10 or 20 years in the West of them implementing some form of capital controls along with central bank digital currencies, which, perhaps will make it more challenging to move capital out of country X, Y, or Z into perhaps some of these Eastern countries. Um, so I, 
it's worth considering all of that, but sure, will it have some impact on the dollar? No doubt. Um, but in the short term, medium term, the dollar's not going anywhere. Yeah, I agree. Uh, there are too many people calling, like you say, in the end of the dollar, the dollar's going to crash, the dollar's going to crash. Before it crashes, other currencies will collapse. Um, the euro will crash before the dollar. And when the euro crashes, you can be sure that the dollar will be doing very well at that point in time. If I have cash, I'm very comfortable keeping dollars as opposed to other currencies. Even though I understand that long term, just as with every other main currency throughout history, it'll go down in flames at some point. But we're not at that stage yet, for sure. No matter how insane the politicians are, et cetera, it's just building up, building up, building up. It'll happen eventually, but not now. As we've talked about before, you know, I'm very, very bullish on commodities this decade due to structural deficits really across the periodic table. Um, and then if you look at specific industries and you know, commodities, oil service companies, et cetera, et cetera, um, there's a huge opportunity there, I think. But with what you were mentioning around the dollar, if I, I think the world is going to become much more fixated on um, having stockpiles of um, natural resources. But if you look at gold in particular versus the dollar, it has hasn't done a whole lot, even though it looks like it might be on the verge of breaking out north of $2,000 per ounce. But if you look at the dollar in a slew of other currencies, the Aussie dollar, uh, the yen, um, and a bunch of others, it's at all-time highs, which is saying something that within the system, there is certainly stress. And your point about diversification, I think, is very important, being diversified, being in both East and West. But also, as you were saying, it, it'll probably be increasingly hard to, to shift money around, especially seeing that sanctions get implemented by the financial sector in, in, a, in a bit of a retroactive way. So let's say before the, before the whole Russia situation, if you had been making regular transfers to Russia and you had business activities in Russia, in 80% of cases, your current bank would just kick you out and then you'd have to, to find a new bank. So there's also that risk of when you make all of these investments in these, in these countries that at some point suddenly sanctions against whatever country show up, you're invested there, and then most of your banking relationships, relationships get shut down. Um, so increasingly building conduits to be able to make these investments is really important. And it's not just from a banking point of view, but it's it's taking the, the whole game to, to a new level in the sense that probably, I mean, if, let's put it this way, if you're a Westerner and you're serious about diversification and you want exposure to the other side without getting burned, like actually both of us got <laughs> with Russian stocks, People should be actively acquiring second citizenships of neutral countries. As Westerners, we have passports of extremely aggressive countries that go around and boss people around. That was fine when we were really the bosses. We're not quite entirely the bosses anymore. So now we're just in many cases, middling powers, especially in, in Europe with ex aggressive foreign policies and not that much to back it up. So these passports are increasingly becoming a liability when it comes to making international investments. Um, like recently I was, um, I had a conversation with a fund manager in Venezuela for Venezuelan real estate. The numbers were absolutely amazing. Um, dirt cheap, high yields, in dollars, but he was using a U.S. structure. And I just don't feel comfortable investing in Venezuela using a U.S. structure because as soon as suddenly sanctions start showing up again, good luck with your investments. So what people need to do is to start getting these other citizenships. You know, you can, for example, get a Turkish citizenship by making a $400,000 investment either a bank deposit in a bank there or $400,000 of real estate in Turkey that gets you, your spouse, and all your underage children and future underage children 
Turkish citizenship? Is it a good thing for investments in other parts of the world? Probably at some point it'll be useful. It could also be a liability if suddenly Turks become the, the are the next Russians, and then you find yourself with this passport and you were too loud about it and told everyone about it, then suddenly you might find yourself under sanctions everywhere you go. Um, or people, you know, could consider, especially people that work online and then have or that have time on their hands, people should just move to Latin America for a few years, get themselves a Latin American passport the normal way through immigration, and then start investing as a Mexican around the world. And nobody hates Mexicans apart from pe some people in the U.S. <laughs> but generally, when you invest, especially in that new fertile crescent, um, there could be sanctions, whatever, but you as a Mexican citizen, if you invest using that citizenship and you're not necessarily too loud about the other ones, again, this is not financial or tax advice um, or legal advice, but it could make your life a lot easier down the line. But this is essentially the world that we're entering into. If you have a lot of capital, to invest and you want to diversify on the other side of the world, you're going to have to really start seriously considering such, such moves. To add to that a little bit, because one of the frameworks that I use for looking at the world is one of deglobalization, which is resulting in balkanization and again, this bifurcation between East and West is that probably sometime in the middle of the last decade is when we reach peak globalization. And then it began to slow to go into reverse. And now you're seeing you know, near shoring of factories in Mexico um, and also on shoring back in the US um, due to cheap energy. But we had reached peak economies of scale, which means that when we go in reverse, that's inherently inflationary because you go from having a factory in China that has the ability to produce you know, 20 million widgets a year to saying, well, we want to diversify and have one factory in the United States, but we don't need that factory producing 20 million widgets per year. We only need one and a half, which means that your cost per unit has gone up. Um, for what you're talking about with citizenships and you know, second order thinking in terms of what's going to happen and how to position not only your capital, but um, how to position yourself to be able to protect your capital and I guess yourself in due course, um, Unfortunately, with the way the world's heading, um, sure, buying second citizenship or acquiring second citizenships through one way, shape or form is certainly an added cost. But with the world that we live in and that we're acceleratingly moving into, um, it's, uh, it's perhaps a necessary evil because, again, it's expensive and uh, you know, time consuming and burdensome to do so. But if you look at where we're heading, it's probably a really wonderful hedge. So I agree with you. All right, fantastic. Thank you very much, Scott. So everyone, I really recommend that you follow Scott on his Telegram channel. It's called Yorta. There is a link below. And then he often posts his own analysis in terms of the what's happening in that part of the world. Also, sometimes he shares some of the stocks that he's invested in and shares a lot of very interesting articles. So it's a channel that I really like to, to follow. Great. So, Scott, thank you. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Ladislas. Take care. You can go to my website, thewanderinginvestor.com, and sign up to the private list. It's entirely free. This way, you will be getting insider information as I travel around the world looking for opportunities. Lastly, feel free to follow me on Instagram at The Wandering Investor. I look forward to hearing from you.